I just really? Uh huh. miembro correspondiente de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias. Y el doctor Fernando Álvarez Noguera, investigador del Instituto de Biología de la UNAM y proponente del doctor Lejandre. También saludamos con mucho gusto a la doctora Rosaura Ruiz, expresidenta de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias y también proponente del doctor Lejand, así como al doctor Javier Alcocer de la FES Iztacala de la UNAM y colega proponente del doctor Lejand. Toma la palabra la doctora Elba Escobar, quien dirigirá las palabras de bienvenida. Muchas gracias, Renata. <coughs> Muchas gracias a todos por estar el día de hoy aquí, acompañarnos a esta ceremonia tan importante de miembro correspondiente de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias. Como miembro de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias, también le doy la bienvenida a Rosaura Ruiz, al doctor Luis Morán y a todos los demás colegas que están aquí presentes, que también son miembros, muchos de ellos, de la Academia de Ciencias. ¿Sí? Les, eh, esa es una simple bienvenida a todos a una ceremonia que es de gran importancia y de gran relevancia para los colegas que estamos en la academia y además para los colegas que nos dedicamos a las ciencias del mar. El hacer un reconocimiento de este tipo para el Instituto de Ciencias del Mar como uno de los proponentes y con sus colegas, otros miembros de la comunidad académica de la UNAM, es de gran importancia y es por ello que el día de hoy celebramos que estemos aquí en esta reunión. Es la segunda candidatura que hemos presentado y que ha sido favor, favorablemente aprobada. Eh, la primera en el tema de la oceanografía física, que es un tema que también es de gran interés para nosotros y ese es el de la ecología numérica, que tiene una aplicación no solamente en el marco de la ecología, sino que también es una, una disciplina de gran interés para ciencias del mar. Muchas gracias. A continuación, el doctor Fernando Álvarez presentará la semblanza del doctor Lejand. Buenos días, eh, gracias por la invitación. La trayectoria de Pierre... Bueno, estaba, estaba muy bonito el acento que presentaba ahora. Mi acento francés es un poco no tan bueno. La trayectoria de Pierre Leandre es verdaderamente impresionante. Sus estudios han innovado en la teoría ecológica de manera profunda. Sus contribuciones, algunas de las cuales comentaré enseguida, han combinado la ecología con la teoría matemática para darle una cara de gran formalidad y rigor al análisis, sobre todo espacial para el estudio de procesos ecosistémicos. En su libro clásico Ecología Numérica, que escribió junto con su hermano Luis, 
presentan una figura al principio del volumen en donde describen de manera conceptual o gráfica cómo fluye el análisis de datos ecológicos que forman después lo que llaman conjuntos de datos ecológicos complejos, que se usan para describir estructuras ecológicas, básicamente asociaciones, y estructuras espaciotemporales, que son series de tiempo y datos. En sus contribuciones aparecen mezclas de estadística con materiales para describir los procesos ecológicos, consiguiendo una visión que permite poner a prueba hipótesis concretas. El reconocimiento que ha habido de las contribuciones del doctor Legend es clarísimo. Es uno de los científicos más citados, con más de 85 mil citas, en un área que no es fácil de comprender y de utilizar. Su libro Ecología Numérica solamente tiene más de 16 mil citas. Resalta también que la mayoría de sus artículos son casi siempre uno o dos autores de manera que su contribución es siempre significativa. En especial su artículo, Autocorrelación espacial, un problema o un nuevo paradigma, publicado en Ecology en 1993, eh, para mí es una gran contribución a la cual regreso de vez en cuando para aclarar mis ideas sobre cómo describir hotspots de diversidad. Pierre Lejand es profesor de la Universidad de Montreal, en su currículum vitae, en la primera oración de sus líneas de investigación, dice, cito textual, soy un especialista en ecología numérica, una de subdisciplina de la ecología de comunidades que yo fundé. Ha de ser bonito poder iniciar el currículum propio, estableciendo que uno es especialista en una disciplina que uno mismo desarrolló. Por supuesto que tiene una lista enorme de premios y distinciones. Ha sido premiado con muchos de los más altos honores que puede recibir un ciudadano canadiense. Fue elegido miembro de la Royal Society of Canada a la edad de 45 años. Recibió el premio Michel Jourdan para las eh, ciencias ambientales de la Asociación Francófona para el, para el conocimiento, ARC, ACFAS, y la, el nombramiento de Killiam Research del Consejo Canadiense de las Artes. Recibió la medalla Romanowski de la Sociedad Real de Canadá, el premio Marie Victorin del gobierno de Quebec por sus altos logros en las ciencias puras y aplicadas, la Orden Nacional de Quebec y el premio a su trayectoria como investigador del Consejo Canadiense de Directores de Biología de las Universidades. El premio del presidente de la Sociedad Canadiense de Ecología y Evolución. En 2015 recibió el premio Adrián Pouloua por su cooperación científica con Francia, otorgado también por la Asociación Francófona para el Conocimiento y ha sido reconocido como una leyenda en la, sociedad, eh, en la sociedad de pesquerías canadienses y en la sección canadiense de la American Fishery Society. También en 2015, como una parte de la celebración del centenario de la Sociedad Ecológica de América, la sociedad... Eh, produjo una lista de 115 artículos publicados en sus cinco revistas, en los que las autoridades consideraron que estos artículos eran los que habían hecho las contribuciones más notables a la teoría ecológica en ideas y métodos. Tres de esos artículos esenciales están firmados por Pierre Legendre. En febrero de 2016, finalmente, fue elegido como miembro correspondiente de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias. Su producción es como sigue. 10 libros sobre ecología numérica, 14 contribuciones a otros libros, 278 artículos, 
aclara, como todo hombre sabio y modesto, que tiene seis artículos sometidos ahora. 21 eh, memorias de congresos. Un diccionario inglés-francés de términos en ecología y estadística. Eh, 270 eh, conferencias en congresos, 337 seminarios cortos, 69 cursos cortos de una semana o menos que ha dado en 41 universidades de institutos científicos alrededor del mundo y 16 participaciones en grupos internacionales de trabajo. Bueno, pues es para mí un gran honor haber presentado respetuosamente esta breve semblanza del doctor Pierre Lejeune, cuya estatura académica e intelectual es extraordinaria. Muchas gracias. A continuación, el doctor José Luis Morán, presidente de la Academia, dirigirá unas palabras y hará entrega del diploma correspondiente. Muy buenos días a todos ustedes. Me da muchísimo gusto estar en este lugar con un auditorio tan lleno y con muchísimos jóvenes atendiendo este, a este acto. Eh, doctor Alves Escobar, muchísimas gracias por la anfitrionía de este evento. Eh, obviamente, doctor Pierre Leandro, we are really honored to have you here. Eh, Fernando Álvarez, eh, gracias por esta semblanza tan completa y tan impresionante de de la, nuestro nuevo miembro correspondiente. También le agradezco la presencia a la doctora Rosaura Ruiz, que también eh, fue una de las personas que propusieron al doctor Lillán para ser miembro correspondiente, y a Javier Alcocer, que también este, hizo su propuesta y su trabajo para que esto se diera este, cita. Eh, voy a cambiar a, a, a inglés un poco por respeto a, a nuestro... Miembro correspondiente, eh, espero que no tengan mucho problema en seguir mi, mi, mi inglés. Eh, dear colleagues, eh, through the corresponding membership, uh, the Mexican Academy of Sciences honors those foreign uh, scientists who besides the uh, outstanding academic career have combined significantly to the development of science in Mexico. The Academy uh, currently uh, composes of 2,779 members. From them, uh, 109 are uh, uh, corresponding members, including uh, 12 uh, Nobel Prizes. The impressive uh, profile that uh, Dr. Alvarez has just uh, presented shows that Pierre Leandre has a solid collaboration with Mexican research on ecology research. For several years, Dr. Leandre has worked with uh, some specialized groups uh, on this research area in our country, with the National Autonomous uh, University of Mexico, in particular from the Institute of Marine Science and Limnology, the Institute of Biology and Ecology, uh, the Faculty of Sciences, the Higher Studies Faculty in Iztacala, and the Research Institute on Ecosystems and Sustainability in Morelia in Michoacán. Also, he has worked with research groups from the Autonomous University of El Carmen in Campeche, University of Guadalajara, and uh, the Center for Research and Advanced Studies, uh, Simpestab in Merida. It should be no, uh, noted Uh, that uh, the collaboration that Dr. Leander with, uh, with these Mexican researchers groups has resulted in several publications in prestigious international journals. In addition to the globally recognized research, research work, his commitment to our country has been remarkable. He has been involved in several uh, academic activities In particular, in particular, he has participated in fruitful and innovative projects in Mexico and received several Mexican students 
in his laboratory in Canada. The enthusiastic work of uh, Dr. Leandre in our country is an evidence of his invaluable interest in Mexican scientific development, especially on numerical ecology research. Uh, Dr. Pierre Leandre, it is an honor for the Mexican Academy of Sciences, the Sciences to welcome you as a corresponding member and a pleasure for me to present you with the corresponding diploma. Thank you very much. Pues damos por terminada la ceremonia y le pedimos al doctor Pierre Lerat eh, pasar a dictar su conferencia, una breve historia del desarrollo de la ecología numérica y solicitamos a los miembros del presidium si pueden tomar sus lugares al frente. Muchas gracias. Yes, I think how it works. So I'm afraid I will have to present my talk in uh, English. Uh, and this is a shame because uh, there are people in uh, North America who are not English speakers, and that includes <coughs> the Francophones of Canada, and that includes the people of Mexico. But uh, today to communicate uh, about science, Throughout the world, we are using English, so I'm going to present this talk also in English, as I'm doing when I come here to give short courses. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> sorry for that, and let us proceed with this. In, I'm going to tell you this brief history of the development of numerical ecology, so that Uh, the members of the academy know what you have bought when you invited me in the academy. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> okay, numerical ecology is a, a portion a field of quantitative ecology devoted to the numerical analysis of ecological data and uh, <clears throat> with emphasis on community composition data that are multivariate data. So quantitative ecology is broader than that. It involves also population dynamics, population genetics, and all that, that uses a lot of mathematics. But here, we in numerical ecology, we devote the work to the analysis of data tables that are multivariate. So this is what I'm saying here. Community ecologists whose data are multivariate by nature are the primary users of these methods that we have developed because in community ecology, you may sample at different sites and look at many different species. You will have a first data table with many rows, sites, and many, many columns that are the species. An additional data table with many environmental variables, uh, climatic variables. Also, we can use geography as additional data tables. So we end up with many data tables that all have many columns. So you cannot do correlation coefficients with that. You have to use more advanced methods, and these are the methods of numerical ecology. It is a subdiscipline of ecology. It is not a subdiscipline of statistics. I'm an ecologist, not a statistician. And uh, <clears throat> so it is not a subdiscipline of mathematical, uh, any mathematical discipline. In numerical ecology, we choose the methods to answer questions and test ecological hypothesis about the data. We don't develop methods for their statistical beauty, although they may be very nice statistically, but the, the purpose is to answer ecological questions. When tests of significance are necessary, and they are often necessary, then we have to 
use or develop statistical methods that are applicable to multivariate data that are also non-normal data. So this is an additional difficulty of all the statistical testing involved in numerical ecology. Okay, we, <coughs> this field uses the work of a great number of scientists Pioneer researchers who developed important concepts and numerical methods of multivariate data analysis include Paul Jacquard, who was a botanist working in the Alps. And in 1900, he developed the famous Jacquard <coughs> similarity coefficient that is still used throughout the world. So it is not because the publication is older than five years that it is not useful. In numerical analysis, we bank upon the work of past uh, researchers. David Godal is quite an interesting person. Uh, was the first ecologist to work and publish an ordination, an ordination graph for vegetation data in 1953. Now, this man is still an active scientist in Australia. He is 105 years old. <clears throat> he is the oldest uh, active scientist in Australia. I've had the chance of, to meet him a couple of years ago at a, at a conference. Uh, Robert Sokol is another great name. Uh, <clears throat> and the numerical ecology banks upon his work because he with, uh, <clears throat> with uh, Peter Sneet, developed uh, numerical taxonomy in the years 1960. And many of the methods that they developed, I learned them during my PhD. And I used that to start analyzing ecological data. So he is my mentor in science. Uh, John Gower is a great researcher from the Rothamsted Experimental Station in England. And he developed many methods, many methods of statistical analysis for numerical taxonomy and for numerical ecology. I will mention some of his methods a bit later when we, I go by uh, uh, blocks of 10 years. <clears throat> Robert Whitaker, who, who in ecology doesn't know Robert Whitaker? He is the one who developed the concept of alpha, beta, and gamma diversity. He, before that, he was also the author of the definition of the five kingdoms of living, living beings. Now we have six, but he developed the idea that there were more than two kingdoms, there were five. And in his lab in Cornell University, he hired young people who had a mixed formation of ecology and statistics and who developed the first computer programs for ordination and other types of data analysis for community data that were freely distributed throughout the world. So we owe a lot to Robert Whitaker. <clears throat> Finally, Caillou Terbrac developed the canonical analysis method of canonical correspondence analysis. And in the next slide, yeah, there are many others, of, of course, who are important, but I chose a few that were especially important to me. So the field of numerical ecology also developed and thanks to the work of software developers. And in particular, I start again with Caillot Herbrac, because in addition to developing canonical correspondence analysis, he also worked uh, out, wrote the Canoco program that was the first a general software for ordination, simple ordination and canonical ordination. It was widely distributed throughout, throughout the world. For a long time, it was the only good software to do this sort of analysis. Now we are also doing these things in R, but many people are still using current versions of Canoco. And uh, Kajo Terbrach is from the Netherlands. Many developer of numerical ecology package in the R language. I will list a few of them in later slides. So there were also foundation books before we, uh, with my brother, we started uh, writing about numerical ecology. Uh, a foundation book was the introduction to mathematical ecology by Evelyn Christine Pilou, who was then at Queen's University in Canada. And so this was a broader text all mathematical applications uh, to ecology. And this included many of the methods now that, uh, that are now embedded in numerical ecology. Laszlo Orlozzi 
in the University of Western Ontario, wrote, I believe, the first book devoted to the multivariate analysis of vegetation research. So his book was had a clear focus on vegetation analysis. And he was at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. And in the same university, but in another department, Roger Green wrote a famous book, Sampling Design and Statistical Methods for Environmental Biologists. So he focused on how should we sample the environment. We all owe him a great, uh, great respect for, because we are using his methods everywhere now. So these were only a few examples of great books. Now I'm going to tell you uh, <laughs> the history of how we started using this expression, numerical ecology. It started during a seminar on applied mathematics to biological oceanography that was held in Villefranche-sur-Mer in a marine lab on the shore of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea. This was in May 1975. Uh, small parentheses, yesterday some students asked me, how do you develop your scientific career? How, how do you manage to, to accomplish something uh, when you are a young scientist? Well, my advice to young students, to young scientists, is to take advantage of opportunities. You never know when an, an opportunity will offer itself, will not uh, knock at your door. And you have to have a mind that remains open <clears throat> and available to take advantage of these opportunities. This was one opportunity that was totally unexpected to me. So this meeting <coughs> was with about 12 people, mostly marine people. And during three days, we uh, examined a new trend in the ecological literature, which was the statistical analysis of multivariate ecological data. So all participants had done a bit of that in their own way. And we all spoke several times during these three days. My brother, Louis Legendre, is an oceanographer. And he got his PhD in uh, biological oceanography from uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax. Uh, he had been invited to that meeting. And independently, I was also invited. And I am I was then a community ecologist with past formation in numerical taxonomy, as I mentioned before. So at that point, uh, after our PhDs, Louis uh, took uh, his position in Université Laval, and I took up a research position in the university in Montreal. But we had not talked very much about what each one of us had done during our PhDs, because we were so far away. <clears throat> And it is during this meeting that I sat and listened to what my brother was talking about, things that he had developed and was using during, during his PhD. And he sat and listened to what I talked about. And we were surprised to realize that there was some complementarity to our points of view. Yeah, this is the view of the uh, Pleasance Harbor of the small town of Villefranche-sur-Bain. We are ab about 10 kilometers east, east of this here on the Mediterranean coast. And these are the old buildings of the biological station. And our meeting took place in this building here. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so on the closing day of the meeting, we went to a restaurant and had dinner together with view on the harbor. It was very nice. And of course, we drank a little wine. Uh, because you have to drink wine when you are in France. Huh? And <clears throat> so after a while, we, uh, we realized, we discussed about this complementarity, and we took the paper napkin, you know, on which we were served, turned it around, and started writing <clears throat> topics on the napkin and reordered them in some way. And uh, that list because it became the table of content of the first edition of our book that we published a few years later. So we jumped on this opportunity. And three days before, we had no idea that we would write a book together, and even less so on a topic that did not exist in the literature, numerical ecology. OK, this is a <clears throat> picture of this uh, first edition. 
that was published in, uh, by the publisher Masson in Paris. It was in two volumes because at the time you could not put 473 pages in one soft cover. It would fall apart. So they printed that in under two covers. Uh, <clears throat> then we knew that with the book written in French, we would not be, be read by the Chinese and the Finns and so on, maybe by the, by the people speaking Spanish. Many of them at the time spoke French. But we decided to work on an English version of that first edition. And we assembled a group of people who helped us translate the book in good English. And it produced this book in a collection that had this ugly brown cover. <laughs> Never again will I publish a book with a cover like that. And you will see after that, we change the color for the later editions. Yet you see that there is a timeline here that develops. Uh, red are the meetings, green are the books, okay? <clears throat> the numerical ecology book. So <clears throat> the year following that, we published a second edition that was already expanded. We are now at 618 pages. So we are in this arrow here, second edition of the French <clears throat> edition book. Yeah, the preface here was written by uh, Professor Margalef, famous for his work in oceanography and in limnology. This is what we looked like at that time, 19, 1986. Many of you may know my brother, the oceanographer, and that's me there. And actually, this picture was taken uh, on, the, on the day where, on the evening, with went to the airport, got on a plane, and went to this NATO advanced study workshop that we had organized about numerical ecology, a workshop that lasted, uh, as I remember, 10 days. It was at the biological station of Roscoff in uh, France. And there we had about five scientists during these 10 days discussing the new developments in numerical ecology. <clears throat> Uh, there were presentations of methods of, uh, of analysis by statisticians and other people like me who had developed methods but were not statisticians. And in the uh, every afternoon, we had discussion groups of ecologists who discussed problems uh, with the methods and the applicability of the methods to different ecological questions. And this led to the publication of a book of proceedings we are now, let's see, book, 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 this one. <clears throat> okay, so the red arrow is the meeting and the next year we had the book. Then a few years later, uh, that was, uh, what is it, uh, 12 years later, the field had developed so much that we decided to work on a new edition of the book. This was a, a big change in the size of the book. We are now at 853 pages. <clears throat> And there were new sections about many, many different methods, including the new methods of canonical analysis that were becoming very important for community ecology. So we are here with the arrows. <clears throat> and uh, yes, uh, for that book, the work took about uh, three and a half years to produce that book. Uh, <laughs> it is not like writing a novel, you know, when you write a textbook. <clears throat> <clears throat> and then another, uh, <clears throat> what, uh, 14 years after that, we published the current uh, book in 2012 that, uh, that is now over a thousand pages. <clears throat> and this is, uh, uh, when we consider all editions of the book, we are over 18,000 citations of these books. <clears throat> so it means that people, uh, buy the book, yes, but uh, they, they consult them, they read the books, they use them for teaching, and they refer to them in scientific papers because we have 18,000 citations. <clears throat> now, during the two and a half years or three years where uh, we worked uh, on this edition, I knew there was a problem because by that time, we had started using the R language for computation and we, uh, several people had developed a list of practical exercises for the analysis of ecological data in the R language. And I thought, gosh, if we, I put 
of these exercises in this same book, I will have to add about 300 pages. The book will, will not hold, it will be too big. So <clears throat> I used the following trick. I convinced two colleagues who had developed <clears throat> uh, exercises like that to, oh yeah, this is a picture of us again in, two, uh, in 2002. Uh, by that time, my brother had uh, left Quebec City and he had become the director of the Marine Station where the whole story started in 1975. So <clears throat> he's been the director of that station for about 10 years. <clears throat> uh, so, yes, I got together with these three people. You will see their pictures in a moment. Daniel Barca, who is uh, an ecologist from Switzerland, and now he is my... <clears throat> Uh, colleague in, in my lab, uh, we worked. We have been working together uh, for a long time. And François Gillette uh, uh, from uh, France, from the University of Besançon, he had also written practical ex exercises. So I told them, let's get together and publish a book with all our practical exercises. And that will free some space in the green book. So we have the green book and the orange book. You see the orange book, orange arrow here. <coughs> And indeed, we worked for about two years on the Orange Book and published it in 2011, before the last edition of the Green, Green Book came out in 2012. Now in the Green Book, at the end of each chapter, I simply have one page saying, in this chapter, we saw this and that method. Here are, is the software in R to implement the method and refer to the, to the other book for details. Now, this book is not simply a list of practical exercises, but each chapter and each section of each chapter contains an expose <coughs> of, excuse me, of what the methods uh, described in the sections are about. And all that was written by Daniel Barca, who is a super teacher, and he, wrote, he knows how to write things uh, for application people. Actually, he got the prize for for the best teacher in our university. So he's a good, uh, a good man to be in charge of that, and he has been in charge of that book. OK, here is Daniel Bocard, uh, Francois, Francois Gillette from Besançon, and there I am, uh, that was taken on a boat <laughs> in, in New Caledonia. <laughs> Uh, a, a funny thing, I was saying that you have to take advantage of opportunities. Well, <clears throat> Daniel Barcar has, has known François Gillette for a long, long time. They met at the University of Neuchâtel when they were graduate students together. But I had never met François Gillette until about a year ago, where the three of us gave a course together in Trieste in Italy. And there I shook hands for the first time with François Gillette. So nowadays you can write a book without ever, ever having met the, one of the others. <clears throat> one thing about this book is that we convinced the publisher, Springer, to let us put all the R scripts of the book and the data sets on a web page. This web page, it does not sit in a computer that belongs to Springer. It sits in a small uh, server in my lab. So we have full control of it, and Springer agrees to have that so that we can distribute all this material free of charge for everybody on the planet. Okay, So all the uh, data sets used in the book and all the scripts of the exercises. You don't have the text presenting the methods. For that, you have to buy the book either in paper form or electronic form. But at least uh, users throughout the world have access to it the way of doing all these calculations. <clears throat> and then we update this as the R language developed. We don't have to wait for a new edition of the book. That's our strategy. <clears throat> OK, in the, uh, during the, the, the past years then, this young man, Jan Sang Lai, from the Institute of Botany Chinese Academy of Science, spent a year and a half in my lab. And he learned uh, the methods and all that. And when he went back to China, he translated the R book to Chinese. And the R book was published then in Chinese by Higher Education Press in Beijing in 2014. So we have the, uh, the R book in Chinese and it is uh, distributed very widely. It seems that it sells very well throughout China. 
because it contains the same material as the <clears throat> the English version. Of course, all the R text is in our language, which is derived from English. So we did not have to translate that. They could not translate it. All the commands of R are in pseudo English. But he translated all the other sections that uh, describe it. <clears throat> so we are now here with that book. And uh, then we uh, worked on a second edition of the R book in English. Uh, about a week ago, we finished correcting the proofs of this new edition. So this is uh, the picture of the real cover of the second English edition, and it will come out before the end of this month. So this is a nice improvement. And uh, of course, when the book comes out, we will send uh, an electronic copy to Jian Sang in China so that he can produce a second Chinese edition. And we are hoping to publish an edition in Española <clears throat> with the help of the people here at UNAM. Uh, we had a meeting yesterday, I can say it, with the representatives of the Fondo de Cultura Económica, and we asked them to be the publisher of that book. So here for fun of it, I wrote their name on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> but the cover may look entirely different from that. This is uh, fake, uh, like fake news, you know. <laughs> I'm presenting fake news. <laughs> Okay, so here the, there is an orange arrow with an interrogation mark. Uh, when we have the agreement of Fondo, then we can uh, start doing, uh, well, the people here can start doing the translation of that book. Okay, uh, here I added this section that is a bit heavy, but it is important. It is some important papers across the years. A student who would take my classes either in my university or abroad, sometimes they are under the impression that everything we have in that book has existed since the Precambrian. But uh, many of these things have appeared fairly recently. Okay? So I made a quick tour here uh, by blocks of 10 years of the most important developments, at least in my opinion, the most important contributions of methods to numerical ecology. So this uh, will cover about 50, the last 50 years. Uh, <clears throat> so the, these papers have changed not only the way colleges analyze data, but also the way we are teaching numerical ecology to graduate students in universities. And this is not an, ex an exhaustive list. It is just my own choices. Uh, <clears throat> I start here in uh, 1964 with the development of redundancy analysis, the first form of two-table analysis that we call canonical analysis, like the metrics with sites and species. You want to relate it to a metrics of the same sites, but with environmental variables. The joint analysis of these two tables is called uh, canonical analysis, this form of canonical analysis, and it was invented by this uh, Indian statistician, Rao, and uh, then republished by uh, psychometrician Wollenberg a few years later. Okay, principal coordinate analysis. I mentioned John Gower as an important person. He developed this method of ordination for data that are in the form of a distance or dissimilarity metrics. Very important, very useful for us in ecology and in genetics. Uh, I mentioned Whitaker with Alpha, Beta, Gamma diversity. Time constraint clustering. This is a way of taking a time series and finding breaking points in time series. But when the time series is univariate, it is fairly simple. You simply have to draw a graph and find the, the points where it changes. But when the time series is multivariate, it is more difficult. So this was developed by uh, two researchers in Scotland, Gordon and Burks. And John Burks has become the, the Pope of paleoecology. You may know his name as the big man in the field of paleoecology. <clears throat> uh, Spatially constrained clustering was developed by Len Lefkovich at Agriculture Canada. And a few years later, I developed a version of that in a paper published with my father, Vianney Legendre, who was a fish biologist. <clears throat> 
metric and Euclidean properties of dissimilarity coefficients. I had the pleasure to work personally with John Gower on this paper. I thought that nobody would ever refer to that paper that was severely mathematical, you know. Well, this happens to be one of our uh, most cited papers because everybody who makes any development now on dissimilarity measures automatically refers to that, to my great surprise. <laughs> but uh, John Gower is a very nice man to work with. Canonical correspondence analysis, I also I already mentioned that, developed by Coyote back in the Netherlands. Uh, the first version here of the, the Black Arrow is for software. Uh, the first distributed version of Canoco was in 1988. <clears throat> Spatial analysis as a tool for community colleges. The ideas were written down in a paper by uh, myself and Marie-Josée Fortin. <clears throat> and then what we have, oh, the famous method for variation per partitioning developed by Daniel Borcar and co-authors. That is, when you have your community data here, then you have a first matrix of environmental variables and other metrics uh, about, let's say, topography or uh, geography and things like that, and other metrics with uh, geographic coordinates. You can look at the variation among the sites in your first metric and partition it among the three, two, three, or four other matrices using this method that is uh, widely used by ecologists. Uh, the new paradigm for ecology, well, it was mentioned during your presentation of my work. <clears throat> yeah, before that, ecologists thought that spatial autocorrelation was, you know, a, a trouble invented by statisticians to make their life miserable. So I turned the question around and showed ecologists that it was a very important uh, property of natural system that they were autocorrelated, and we have to study that in order to understand the processes that generate these special organization of communities. So this is why this paper is here is heavily cited. Uh, Co-inertia analysis, another form of two-table analysis, indicator species analysis developed by uh, <coughs> Uh, an entomologist from Belgium, Marc Dufresne, who came as a postdoc in my lab, uh, RLQ analysis and Fort Corner analysis. These are two versions of the same idea developed independently, one in France and the other one in my lab. Distance-based redundancy analysis, how to do this form of canonical analysis when you start with uh, dissimilarity metrics. We published a way to do that. Uh, now we go to the years 2000. Uh, <clears throat> I developed with, uh, with Eugene Gallagher a series of transformation for community composition data that allow us to take community composition data and use them in principal component analysis and in other forms of uh, linear uh, methods of analysis. Spatial eigenfunction analysis, I will not talk about that uh, at length, but this is a way of modeling the spatial structure of multivariate communities in a very fine way. Actually, the, wor the name looks worse than, than the, the, the reality. Uh, when I explained it, uh, then the students understand it and can use it uh, easily. There was an asymmetric version developed by Guillaume Blanchet. You will see a picture of him in a later slide. Uh, this is to model the distribution of communities driven by physical gradients like currents in the sea that or currents in rivers. How is it that this directional dispersion uh, <clears throat> may be responsible for the structuring of the communities that you see through space? So it was this method that was developed by this great student. Concordance analysis of species association the rationale for estimation of beta diversity. I will talk about that in the talk on Thursday. And uh, improving indicator species analysis. Then in the last portion, the years 2010 to the present, uh, I worked again on the mantle test. And that will be my talk on Friday. Many ecologists and geneticists use the mantle test as a way of doing spatial analysis. On Friday, and following these two papers, 
uh, I will try to convince you that this is the worst thing you can do and that there are good alternatives, easy to use in, instead of the mental test. So <clears throat> come on Friday if you want to hear more about that. Uh, we can test the space-time interaction in community surveys. I think I gave a talk about that in this room about five or six years ago. <clears throat> uh, test of significance of the canonical axis, yes. Work done with Yari Aksanen and Kayo Tebrak. Uh, partitioning beta diversity, yes. Uh, so I will talk about these two topics on Thursday. And this is about beta diversity in space and in time. And yeah, again, <clears throat> this will be one example of this application to time multivariate time series. Oh, yes, actually, this is the basic paper for my talk tomorrow to undergraduate students, where I will show the, how we uh, <clears throat> analyze the, uh, the, the changes in communities of mollusks that occurred after atmospheric nuclear test on an atoll in the Pacific. And we have 30 years of data that show how the communities have recuperated. And then there's a portion in that talk where I discuss the main ecological theories that may explain how the communities recuperate and we will see which one of these theories applies to the data on this at all. <clears throat> the answer is surprising. Okay, and then there are more <clears throat> of that. Uh, <clears throat> numerical ecology is the result of many years of col collaborative work with many dedicated researchers, and uh, we produce a word cloud here with the names of many of these close collaborators, people that work with me and we publish many papers together. So there's my good friend Daniel Barca here. My brother Louis is here uh, associated with Lejong. You see uh, Caillot Terbrac here, Stéphane Dre, Pedro Pérez Neto, uh, <coughs> let's see, Makarenkov, uh, Marie-Joseph Fortin, Fang Yanghe, uh, originally from China. Uh, Miguel de Caceres from Spain. So there are people from many different countries with whom I work, and I took advantage of contacts with them or the fact that they came to my lab as postdocs or just as guests who wanted to work on their data. And we collaborated and produced methodological developments, and some of them were produced with these people. Where are we now? Oh, yes, our software. Uh, numerical ecology has made great progress in the computer age, thanks to the dedication of many developers of statistical packages, especially in the R language, who wrote software designed to analyze ecological data. These are usually people in, working in universities. So they do that as part of their research work. They are not paid to develop our software in particular, but they just do it because it's part of our work and it is interesting to develop software that can be useful to other people like you. <clears throat> the R statistical language had been created in New Zealand by two researchers in the Department of Statistics of the University of Auckland, Rasiaka and Robert Gentleman. I understand that he is originally a, an English Canadian, Robert Gentleman. Uh, <clears throat> so it became a, an international project of inter an international collaboration. And then the R software is in distributed on a site that is called CRAN, the abbreviation of this. And the first stable version appeared in a magic date on the 29th of April of February of the year 2000. They chose their date, the unique. And here's the appearance of the R <coughs> software. Since then, it has been left to uh, collaborators, people like you, uh, who wrote R software and assembled them in packages. And at this point, there are about 12,000 R packages available on the R, uh, the R CRAN site. Each package may contain only a few functions, but others contain hundreds of functions. So this is a wealth of methods of calculation that is freely available to everybody. And I understand that you all use the R language for your calculations, as you should. <clears throat> Here, I will just mention three packages that have been especially important for ecology. Uh, 
Vegan uh, uh, <coughs> appeared in 2001. The leader of that package is Yari Aksanen at the University of Ulu in Finland. Another person to, with whom I collaborated, and then I met him finally uh, just a few years ago. <coughs> Then ADE4 had been developed in Lyon by Daniel Chassel and co-authors. And the maintainer now is Stéphane Dre, now that Daniel Chassel has retired. And the, the, this package has been on CRAN since 2002. <clears throat> uh, in 2006, another important package, Facto Minor, maintained by François Husson in Rennes, in France also, uh, was put on CRAN. <clears throat> So, uh, yes, I am adding these black arrows for these three packages. Another important package for community ecology is described in the next few slides. And I go back to the history. <coughs> uh, here is Stéphane Dre. He worked in my lab as a postdoc after his PhD in Lyon. And he is now the lead author of AD4 and of a new package that I'm going to describe. Uh, <coughs> So in 2008, uh, he organized a workshop in Lyon with the acronym CEDAR. And so this must be this conference here. And uh, the idea was to coordinate efforts among researchers who are interested in spatial analysis of ecological data and to make plans for a new R software package. Here are a, picture, a few pictures that I could, took during that meeting. Here is Stéphane Dre. I mentioned Miquel de Caceres, who developed indicator species analysis from Spain. Let's see who do we have. Jean Thioulouse was one of the leaders of AD4. Marie-Jose Fortin, my colleague from the University of Toronto. And here is Guillaume Blanchet, the young man who developed the asymmetric form of spatial analysis. Now, what more? Ah, Yari Aksanen. Here is the man and uh, <coughs> the, the leader of the vegan package. And my good colleague, Pedro Perez Neto, originally from Brazil. And we have worked closely on many different papers and methods. <coughs> One of the results of this workshop is a new package called AD Spatial, because it is devoted to spatial analysis. But we include also many functions <coughs> that uh, allow to do analysis of time series, <clears throat> um, but it is uh, devoted to space-time, uh, spatial and time series analysis of community data and under the direction of Stéphane Dre, it appeared on CRAN in 2016. It must be this arrow here. <laughs> uh, new functions are still being added to this package. <clears throat> and, uh, and now in 2018, we are in version 10 of this package because we are adding functions all the time. <clears throat> the figure in the next slide is a network of contributors. It is taken from the list of references of the uh, last edition of the Green Book, the Numerical Ecology Book. And uh, <clears throat> my young colleague, uh, <clears throat> Vladimir Makarenkov, removed the single author references <coughs> from the network. And here it goes. <coughs> That's a very impressive thing. So you have names of collaborators uh, here. And in green, you have all the ecologists. And in blue are the other people, either statisticians or people from related field like psychometrics. And the size of the bubble is proportional to the citation on Google Scholar. And you see the lines are who collaborated with whom on at least one paper. So that's an interesting way of presenting things. Now, the figure described this network from the 2012 edition of the book. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm reading my notes here. Of course, uh, a list of references taken from a book uh, always give, give more emphasis to the authors of the book. So this is why I'm in the center of the cloud, because many of my papers are referred to in the book. Uh, still, <clears throat> uh, this shows that the development of the data analysis method for ecologists is the result of a broad and fruitful 
collaboration among many scientists. Nowadays, you cannot do science alone. Okay, this last short section uh, referred to the short courses in numerical ecology that I gave in different parts of the world, and you mentioned that in your presentation. Thank you. So here's a map of uh, Australia and related countries. This is New Caledonia, where I also gave course. I gave two in Perth, so, so much for Australia. Here is Europe, where uh, I gave courses from Norway here. In many cases, these courses are given in universities or in biological stations. So this is a biological station near a glacier in Norway, in the high mountains. This one is a biological station of the University of Stockholm. Loch Lamond is the biological station of the University of Glasgow, and so on, many different stations. And uh, yeah, Ischia is a biological uh, station also in the an island in front in front of uh, Napoli and and so on so and the numbers indicate places where i gave three or four different courses including here the famous lab of villefranche sur mer oops <clears throat> next slide uh, these are the courses that i gave in asia uh, three times in beijing one time in guangzhou and i gave a lot of courses in taiwan so I know there is a lot of interest for this type of uh, topic among the, uh, the scientists in China and in Taiwan. Uh, North America, I gave courses in Canada, right up to Nanaimo here and in various places in the USA. And finally, the northern portion of the equatorial zone includes Honolulu, uh, Pointe à Pitre in Guadeloupe, Panama, and then the courses that I gave in Mexico, one in Merida and three right here at UNAM. So yeah, now uh, there's a long list of references because all the topics that I mentioned during the development years, uh, I listed the references at the end of this talk. So this is the end of my presentation and I thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions. And uh, I believe there is a PDF of that presentation that may be distributed around. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Muchísimas gracias a todos eh, por permanecer y estar aquí con nosotros. ¿Quién quisiera hacer preguntas? ¿Quién tuviera preguntas para el doctor Leyendo? Por favor. Eh, ¿Me pasan el doctor micrófono? Gracias. Por favor. Um, thank you for such a great presentation. Maybe my question is going to be very specific. I am not sure. I'm a quantitative ecologist also, and uh, I'm more, I come from the univariate um, statistics. And, um, but I know that in statistics, in univariate statistics, we, we, we deal with many, with problems of non normality, non linearity, uh, hierarchical modeling. And I, I, I was wondering how, how important. Uh, is that for you in the multivariate? Because I feel that uh, it has been more on the normal, linear um, way of doing things. I'm not sure if a lot of work has been devoted on that. I know that Guillaume Blanchet, I know him, and I think he's, has, he's done some work on that, but I'm not sure if you okay, have there are, those similar There interests. are two parts of my answer. Uh, first, when it comes to the statistical testing, I mentioned at the beginning that we rely on permutation tests all the time. We cannot use uh, you know, the normal parametric test because our data are utterly non-normal. And they are multivariate, so there is no way of controlling or normality or transforming the data. So we do all the testing using permutation tests, and these same tests can be applied to univariate data using the same software. When you have one, only one response variable, uh, uh, RDA, clinical analysis, becomes multiple regression, but the testing is done by uh, permutation tests. Now, uh, it is true that there is a strong emphasis in our present method to, into the linear model of analysis, 
And it's because the linear model uh, <clears throat> has no problems of convergence and you can uh, obtain solutions with the uh, uh, matrix equations and uh, <clears throat> but uh, there are attempts at the moment to develop uh, the equivalent of GLMs for multivariate data, but they have problems of convergence and so on. But in the linear model, there is a very precious statistic called the R square. And actually, we use the adjusted R square instead of the R square. But this is the basis for variation partitioning. And they, they are equivalent statistics in PLM or in uh, mixed models, but they, they don't behave so well. And the last part is that the, we develop methods of transforming our community composition data or genetic data so that they can be analyzed correctly with linear models. They are the transformations. So this is our answer at the moment. But in 10 years from now, the field may have changed completely with other types of statistical methods. With other types of statistical methods that can be uh, used. Thank you. I cannot predict the future, okay. just saying that this is what we are doing now. <laughs> Thank you. Turn it off. Yeah, it is on. Turn it off and use my. Yeah, the no, it, has it, been it works. by the moderator. Okay. Alguna te pregunta? Sí, Fernando. Thank you. Um, what's your view about the development of all these methods at uh, the same time as the software has been developed to use them? Because for a regular user, or a, you know, a um, let's say an average ecologist, would be too hard to do all the math by hand. Yeah, yes, of course, of course. So, so um, what's your uh, uh, view or feeling about this marriage between the methods and the software yeah, well, uh, co-evolution? I, I, I think this is a happy, this is a happy marriage uh, by and large. Uh, the, the developers of uh, software, our software for ecologists, they first programs the method that had been uh, there for a long time, like principal component analysis and redone the first forms of canonical analysis and so on. But nowadays, when uh, someone suggests a new method in a paper, one has to provide software or the paper will never be published. So the software is usually added in appendices of the published papers. And if it takes up, if people are using it, then it is transferred to one of these major packages that, uh, <clears throat> that distribute them. Uh, on the other hand, we need also uh, <coughs> books that contain these ideas. And this is why we, we, along the years, we have developed different editions. We have some redundancy there. Okay, so we have developed different, uh, we have written different editions of the green book and of the orange book in order to keep up with the new methods and the development of the software in order to make it easily available to graduate students and uh, field ecologists. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, you're talking often that this type of analysis used in ecology and genetics, which is also the fields we work, mostly work with. But what about other fields like medicine or toxicology? Are they also approaching these types of analysis? Uh, I know about genetics because uh, there are many people in my department who are doing genetic analysis and their students take my courses and apply the same methods. In medicine, I have fewer contacts with these people. I'm not sure exactly what they are using, but I understand from the literature that uh, on occasion I can look at that they are still mostly using univariate uh, 
statistical analysis. And then many papers in the field of medicine, all that you see are, you know, dispersion diagrams or histograms. They're, the statistical analysis are not very developed, except in very advanced research labs. But this is only my opinion from someone who is not in this uh, field of research. But uh, I will give uh, at least uh, one example uh, of uh, the, uh, well, I will give you two genetic applications, one on Thursday and one on Friday uh, about the Mantel test. <laughs> okay. Well, I would like just to take the opportunity, just like uh, Dr. Lejean said, uh, to say thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk, and uh, thank you for your teaching. Uh, Dr. Pierre Lejean was my PhD thesis in, <laughs> some years ago. And of course, thank legacy to uh, all the discipline of the ecology, numerical ecology that was uh, particularly the look for Dr. Pierre Lujan. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this was uh, Dr. Nunez Lara, who indeed was in my lab and we collaborated on something. But uh, your intervention uh, reminded me that uh, I forgot a very important thing. And it was to thank the president of the, the society. He, I was so eager to get into the talk that I forgot my word of thank. And I wanted to tell you that this is a great honor that the Academia Mexicana de Ciencias is bestowing on me. I value this honor particularly because it is offered by my peers, that is the scientists of Mexico. It is not, you know, a government agency. You are a scientist and you are <clears throat> taking me into your academy. And this is indeed a very great honor. Thank you very much to you, Mr. President Luis Moran, uh, <clears throat> and to Dr. Escobar, <laughs> who organized and led the work of several of you who supported my nomination. I thank you all of you, members of the Academy also, who voted in favor of my uh, election. So uh, my thanks come at the end of my presentation, while uh, I should have given them at the beginning, forgive me about this, uh, luck to the protocol. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Pierre. Uh, in addition, um, I would like to add, and I will say it both in Spanish and English, I think this is now a third generation that is being formed because you came and, and worked with my group of students. My students have been hired somewhere, like Luisa in Ecology, now in Merida, and her students have been in your lab. Yes, yes, yes. And I think their students will be <coughs> still moving around and doing some research with you. Yeah, Great. so four generations almost, three generations in, in general. Estaba mencionando que casi son ya tres, cuatro generaciones que se han venido formando de aquí de la UNAM con el profesor Legendre. Mis estudiantes que a la vez después fueron contratados en, como Luisa Falcón en Ecología, cuyos estudiantes han estado en su laboratorio, que ahora son postdocs con nosotros en Ciencias del Mar, y que sus estudiantes a la vez también se están empezando a formar y seguramente irán al laboratorio del doctor Legendre. Este, thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Y le daremos un aplauso al doctor Luis Andre. Y pediríamos a todos quedarse en su lugar, ponerse de pie, porque van a tomar una foto de acá hacia allá. Y le pediríamos al doctor Luis Andre que pase acá para tomarse la foto con nosotros. Los que están en la pared, júntense para que quepan o vénganse aquí al frente. Para que quepan en la foto. Here. They're going to take the picture. The president here. It's your seat. No more. Y nos van a tomar una foto, nos están guiando. Al término de la foto, todos están invitados.